All right. Well, welcome to Roots of Reality Experiences. Today, I'm joined by Tom McMillan, who is the president and CEO of the Lead One Association, which represents the athletic directors and programs of the football bowl subdivision. In the past, Tom was the most highly recruited high school athlete of his era, an All-American basketball player at the University of Maryland, a Rhodes Scholar, and a member of the 1972 U.S. men's Olympic basketball team. Additionally, he played 11 years professionally in the NBA. He is a former member of the United States Congress, a member of the College Basketball Hall of Fame, and is the author of the book, Out of Bounds, Examining the Influence of Sports on Ethics. So, Tom, thanks for coming on today. You're welcome. Good to be on with you, Ben. Thanks. So, when did you first get interested in basketball? Well, my father came from a basketball family. He uh, His career was cur curtailed because he had a form of polio when he was a young man that uh, really damaged his leg, so he was not able to be a, a great basketball player. But his brother was a very good basketball player. He played um, in college at Syracuse, and uh, I think he even played uh, minor league basketball a little bit. So it, it all came from my father's side of the family, uh, yeah. who were very loved basketball. Yeah. So I guess it was in the family DNA then to play yeah. basketball. <laughs> cool. Well, it also helped that my um, my mom's side, uh, they were kind of, they, they, my mom's father was a farmer, but their children, a couple of them were very tall in the 6'4 uh, range. So there was height on my mother's side and there was really height on both sides of the family. So that helped too. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And so what was it like, you know, coming up in high school and being this say, a highly sought after, you know, basketball star? I mean, did you feel pressure? Because I know you were on the cover of Sports Illustrated and you know, all sorts of stuff. Well, being on the cover of Sports Illustrated, I was the second high school athlete ever to be on the cover. Yeah. So it, they always call it the Sports Illustrated curse. You know, it's uh, puts a lot of pressure on a young person. I uh, so I grew up in a very small town and. Uh, there were several reasons why I was able to break out of there and be a, a, a really good basketball player. One was we had a college in our town, Mansfield State College, now Mansfield University, where I routinely practiced with college players. And so that was really vital in my development. Secondly, my brother was six years older than me, and he ended up going to Maryland. He was a very good high school player, went to Maryland, University of Maryland was an outstanding player there. And then he went abroad, played professional in Europe, drafted by the Lakers, and then he went into to medical school. So I had a brother that was very good basketball player. And third was that I had the experience of going to a lot of camps when I was a kid. And so I, I would go to the University of Carolina camp and, and all these camps and they would see me and sort of that created a little bit of a buzz. And, and largely that was because my brother had played right before me. So if I was coming out of that little town of Mansfield, Pennsylvania, and did, hadn't had a brother who played before me, it may not have been the same buzz, but all that created a buzz, which resulted in the cover of Sports Illustrated, which uh, is just a, an amazing thing because back then Sports Illustrated was the, the Bible. I mean, today yeah. it's, not the same thing, but back then it was the Bible. So it was a big deal. <laughs> Do you remember like your first reaction to learning that you were going to be on the cover? Well, I do. And, you know, they had photographers follow me around for weeks on end. <laughs> and, um, and uh, yeah, I knew it was a big deal. Uh, there was one player before me and being the second was pretty significant. It really, it it put my little town on the map, but it also became a magnet. Coaches started, you know, showing up and we had uh, all kinds of national news organizations that came to this little town. And so uh, it was a, um, it was a moment in time that you really can't forget because it was so extraordinary. Yeah. Makes sense. Now, can you talk a little bit about like getting involved with the U S Olympic team and what that was like? Well, I was selected to be part of the 72 Olympic team. There's a tryout in, uh, in, at the Air Force Base. And initially, I didn't make the team. And so I went back home. And we got hit by Hurricane Agnes at the time. And our home was destroyed. So I was working with my brothers 
trying to dig mud out of the house. Oh my and then gosh. A couple of weeks later, I get a call that I'm going back on the team because Swen Nader, one of the players, um, quit. He didn't like the harsh conditions and the and the practice schedules and so forth. So I joined the team a couple of weeks later and we went through a very abbreviated training schedule. We had to we had to get ready to play in the Olympics and we were going to play against teams that had been playing together for years. Yeah. And so it, um, it, it there was a lot of pressure. And uh, we, as I said, we trained at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and it was very brutal. There was no air conditioning. It was really, it was tough. Sometimes we practiced three times a day. It was extremely difficult. The coach of the Olympics back then was Hank Iba and he was an old disciplinarian and, <laughs> he just he was very old school and i think that was hard for a lot of my teammates to adjust to it because he was so old school and uh yet, yet we we you know we managed to move on and then we headed over to munich for the olympics yeah well i think what's really interesting also about like that era of basketball at the olympic level is that you know the american teams were always filled with college kids and you had teams you know around the world that were putting in you know adult men you know that have been playing professionally in their home country like was that kind of weird always to be in that atmosphere despite you know the u.s always considered to be the you know the dominant team but it was it was classic united states having to play with one arm behind its back in other words um the united states was so good at basketball you know founded the sport and everything and as it it spread around the world uh, a lot of nations adopted basketball and became very good at it. I mean, Cuba and Spain and all these countries, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, they in Italy, the, Yugoslavia, they were very good uh, basketball programs and largely because we exported that. We sent coaches over there. We trained these countries how to play. I mean, some of the countries had never played basketball until we, exported our coaches and everything over there the result of that the world was getting better and better at basketball and they had one big advantage was that if you're a pro in europe you could be in the olympics or if you were in the military and you were on the team like the the soviets you could be in the olympics the united states as soon as you crossed over and went to be a pro you weren't able to participate in the olympics so it was really it was really a kind of a two-tiered system so we went into the Munich Olympics. We're 18, 19, 20 years old. We're playing against a Soviet team for the finals. They're 28, 29, 30 years old. So they were they were true pros, you know, well-developed, physically mature and all that. And so it was quite a challenge. Yeah. I mean, that was obviously, you know, the, the craziest game in basketball history uh, because of how insane it was and and what happened. Uh, you know, can you talk about like what was the atmosphere like in that game? I mean, obviously it's during the Cold War still. So, um, you know, what what was going on in the heads of American players, and what were what was the you know, uh, what do you think was the attitude of the Soviet players in that game? Well, first of all, you have to put that in context. Five days before, on September fifth, the uh, Palestinian terrorists had stormed the Olympic Village and ended up killing the, many of the Israeli athletes. That was unheard of. I mean, terrorism itself was pretty unheard of. To have it infiltrate an Olympic village was so my, so surreal and mind-boggling. Yeah. Yet we had to continue to practice and get ready for this game. And it was difficult because you realize that some of your fellow athletes were literally murdered in and out in and outside the village. Um, and the Olympics would never be the same after that particularly the security around the Olympics. And so we were getting ready to play this Soviet team. It was going to be at midnight. Um, and and the reason why it was midnight, so that American fans could watch the game uh, on Saturday afternoon, Saturday early evening. And uh, uh, it, it was a very high stakes game. The Soviets wanted so badly to beat the United States. They had never won in like eight Olympics since 1936. The United States was continuing to dominate. And the Soviets were going to do whatever it takes to win this game. It was so important to their society. It was so important to show the superiority of the Russian and the Soviet system. 
we uh, we were right in the middle of a Cold War conflict. And I, I've always said that we didn't really need to play that game. Uh, Nixon and Brezhnev just could have arm wrestled, as yeah. it turns out. But we did play the game. And as you know, we came from behind and literally won the game. Yep. <laughs> and then they just started resetting the clock. And finally, on the third reset, the Soviets prevailed. And to this day, we refuse to accept the silver medals. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's I can't imagine what it would have been like to be a player in that game. And just it's, you know, <laughs> it just got I me mean, like well, the kookiest sporting uh, things that ever happened. I mean, I just can't imagine. You know, it's like, what is happening here? Like, why? What are you guys doing? <laughs> so, um, it was a comedy of errors, uh, and largely because of the fishing. What happened was, an official who headed up the whole FIBA, which is the International Basketball Organization, similar to the NBA commissioner, came out of the stands and forced the game to re- be to be replayed. That would be akin to the commissioner of the nba coming down and say wait a minute guys we're going to play that last play in the world world finals a couple more times and um and it was so out of out of sorts and we should have won that game if you look at it by any reasonable judgment yes (laughs) um, when uh doug collins took the free throws and made those the soviets were not granted a timeout and the game should have just gone on. The clock should have just run out. Instead, they storm the, 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 the floor and stop the clock, and they get a timeout awarded to them. So they 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 should have lost the game right up front. Yeah. Instead, the referees give them, you know, several times to win, and finally on the third time they won. Yeah. Or, or at least they prevailed. We would never accept the fact that they won. Right, yeah. It's obviously the, yeah, pretty – pretty ridiculous and clearly there's something off about everything that happened there so um yeah understandable um it, uh, did you ever hear about i guess you might you probably did but like when how russia came out with a, a film about that game a few years ago yeah it was a what was, what was your reaction to that <laughs> well it was just understandable that this yeah. was a high moment for uh the soviet <laughs> union and um they, they were, I, I think it had to do with, they were trying to win their 50th medal and it was the 50th anniversary of the, around the 50th anniversary of the of start of the Soviet nation. And uh, there was a lot, there's symbolism yeah. with respect to the Soviets, but the movie was kind of funny because they had these uh, Russian actors playing all of us and, and making it like it was the, the high moment in Russian history. Um, yeah. <laughs> And we, we kind of got even with them with the hockey match a few years later, but they really made, they made that out to be a big deal. And, uh, and the irony of it is, um, you know, the 50th anniversary of that game was uh, this year. And we were trying to get the Naismith hall of fame to uh, put our team in the uh, hall of fame. And here the Soviets put a film out about about their winning it, and it's the most the highest selling film in Soviet history. And then you know we we have trouble even getting basic recognition. Yeah, from from the United States side. So it's very it's it's very unfortunate. Yeah, uh, and uh, the players on our team, we've lost two of them. Uh, one of them died from COVID this past year. Another died from a, a heart issue, and so. You know, it's uh, it brings back a lot of memories, but it's poignant to think 50 years ago this all happened. Yeah. Well, I think one of the, the, the coolest things and why, I mean, obviously, you know, the 1972 team is like the most one of the most memorable teams in American history just because of what happened to you guys and, you know, you know, how you guys stood up for yourselves afterwards. I mean, you know, surely I can know we're not going to accept this. This is obviously a ridiculous situation you guys put us in here. Um, you know, you should have won the game. So uh, it, I think that's what's really cool about your story because it, it does show, you know, something about like what it meant to represent your country in that situation. So a lot of people thought it was kind of Bush League that we weren't accepting the, the silver medal. But in retrospect, 
if we had accepted it, this whole thing would never have been brought up. Now it's brought up every five years, every 10 years. It's continually rerun. Uh, and the fact that we held our ground um, has given it some historical significance. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a story that I think, yeah, just gets passed on from generation to generation. Um, so it's a pretty cool what you guys all did. And um, yeah, so <laughs> pretty, pretty awesome. Um, now I am curious to think about uh, like your transition to playing in the NBA, you know, what was it like to go from, you know, being a college player to the NBA and, you know, what's how the difference in style and everything else? Well, when I was in college at Maryland, I had won a Rhodes Scholarship. So I was the first student ever from the University of Maryland to win one. And I really wanted to fulfill that. Um, it would be hard to do that today because the money is so big. You know, if I was yeah. a first round draft pick, it would be hard to walk away from it. And I was a first round pick and I ended up walking away. I ended up going to Oxford and I played basketball in Italy uh, once or twice a week uh, while I was there so that I could do the, the Rhodes Scholarship. And I, um, I uh, did that for a year and I played basketball. And then I came back a little early because my Rhodes was two years, but I finished that up over three summers and I came back and began my pro career. Uh, the NBA is a tough adjustment. I had trouble adjusting for the first year or so. And then I started getting more into a groove, um, but, it's a tough business. You know, you have to play hurt. You got to, you yeah. got to play night after night. It's a business. It's really a business. And, you know, I played uh, 11 years in the NBA with Europe. That would be 12 years. It's a, it's a long time. And, uh, you know, I was ready to, to go on and do other things after that. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it, it is pretty impressive. Like I don't, I can't think of many athletes in any sport that have a career like you did where <laughs> you go on to doing so many things, but also you were like, you were a serious student, you know, Rhodes Scholar, and you went to Oxford, and then you wanted to be in Congress. I mean, there's not many athletes that do all those things. Um, so it really shows that, I guess you were interested in, and, you know, continuing to do lots of cool things with your life. Yeah, I, you know, if, I always think back about what would I have done differently? Well, you know, I'm glad I finished the Rhodes Scholarship. That was important. I came back and I, I bought a house in Maryland in 78 and I started working politically and here I am playing for the Atlanta Hawks for six years. And I go up to the owner, Ted Turner, I said, will you trade me to Washington so I could run for Congress? And lo and behold, he did that. He traded me to Washington <laughs> so I could play three years in Washington where I had played college basketball. And the start of my last year, my third year, I announced for Congress, I was going to run while I'm in the NBA. And I, I was a candidate for the whole year and ended up winning the closest race in the House of Representatives that year. But I pulled it off, and um, it was an experience to serve in the, in the, in the United States Congress. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. Um, so how do you think basketball has changed um, you know, since your career? Well, when I was in the NBA, uh, first of all, the dunk just came back in, so that was fairly new. They they had this no dunk rule for a long time. And then, of course, the three-point play was instituted right near the end of my career. And, you know, people would shoot it, but it wasn't anything like it is today. I mean, yeah, it was a shot that people just didn't practice like they do today. I mean, if I would have grown up today, I would have been shooting threes, you know, from the time I'm, you know, six years old. And you would have develop a skill set that was entirely different than the skill set I had. I was a good outside shooter as an NBA player. So that was a real asset of mine. And uh, I can imagine if I were playing today, I would have been even a better shooter. Yeah. Uh, so it really has changed the game. It's put a premium on that outside shot and less of a premium on, on the inside game. I think it would have helped my, my career because I was actually a pretty good inside player and I was a, a good outside shooter. Um, but those those rules hadn't been in place long enough to really make that transition. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And especially, you know, since you were, you know, a, you played center. And so, I mean, being able to shoot threes is, is such a, a big piece to have if you're a center these days. So Yeah, and it wasn't that much. And I shot outside a lot. And, yeah. uh, but I, you know, 
stepping over a going back another foot or so would have turned it into a three point play in college. I had the highest scoring record in Maryland's history, but I didn't have a three point. Uh, there wasn't a three point shot in yeah. uh, when yeah. I played. And, uh, and so those are rules that that's how the games change. Sure. So I'm curious then again, in it with you a little bit about like sports and ethics, obviously that's been something that you've, you've thought a lot about in your career and, you know, with your book, um, can you talk about like, what do you think about sports and ethics today? In, in what context? Well, I guess, you know, there's, there's the college aspects, you know, where like, you know, athlete, college athletes and trying to balance, you know, academics in some cases, depending on if you're just going to be a one and done player or an actual, you know, full yeah, four year player. Um, but also, I guess, you know, just thinking about uh, the NBA and the amount of money and stuff and basketball today, you know, what, what are your thoughts on all of that? And do you think things have gotten better since you wrote your book or? I think there's always uh, been this, uh, this tendency to commercialize and chase the dollars and all that. It's just endemic in the American free enterprise system. And, uh, you know, the whole college sports experience was, at least over the years, was meant to marry academics and athletics. It hasn't always done it well. I mean, there are early stories about kids. They would recruit kids just to play sports, didn't care about their academics. But I think over the years, that model has endured. And there's a lot of kids that are coming from very backgrounds that go into college sports. They get an education, they get human development skills, and they come out a better person. So I think overall, that system has been pretty good. Uh, no other country in the world has it, which creates complications, but it has worked. It's been a human development machine in a lot of ways, but there's always the excesses. There's always going to be, you know, money that corrupts, money that really uh, maybe uh, maybe changes the whole higher ed balance that's needed. And so it's always a balancing act. When I wrote my book uh, in, the in the early 90s, it was all about that subject. And today, I could republish that book. The only thing I'd have to do is put another zero on the end of the, of the, of the dollars, where it was, I would talk about a million dollar salary, it would just be 10 million. And so I just have added other zero and edit the book and put it out again because the, the themes are the same. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, what do you make of uh, the now, you know, lots of states passing sports betting and stuff. How do you think that could impact the game? Uh, you know, I'm not so concerned about okay. generic sports betting, um, but I am concerned about it on college campuses. And the reason is that, listen, Sports, bill, sports betting today is a $200 billion legal industry around the world. I mean, there's still a lot of illegal sports betting going on, but for the most yeah. part, the legal business is very big. And it's $5 billion in the United States, uh, up from zero a few years ago. But here's the difference. In America, we have a lot of sports betting going on college campuses. You know, we're betting on you know, the team to win or a player to do something. And we're the only nation in the world that has active sports betting on college campuses. And I think there's a risk there. And just as around the world, there are scandals all the time in sports betting. There are scandals, there's been scandals in Germany and, and, and uh, Pakistan and, and the Far East. And there will inevitably be scandals in the United States and they will be on our college campuses. And I think that's going to be problematic. I, I just think that our universities are one of our greatest assets because that makes us competitive, whether we're competing against the Chinese or what other country in the world. And if you have uh, these kind of scandals on your campus, it'll be interesting to see what happens. If you look back at the scandals at Northwestern and, and, and you know, uh, Boston College and so forth, uh, they 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 were pretty damaging to those institutions. Remember, those were illegal gambling. So there wasn't the university embracing it. This just happened to happen. Well, now universities are embracing sports betting. 
what will be the ramifications if there is a scandal? It, it, it's not if there will be a scandal. Yeah. The question is what will what will the ramifications be? Yeah, it's always it seems like uh yeah always a, a tricky situation, and I've always kind of found it sometimes be uncomfortable to see you know how big college sports becomes when you're dealing with you know just student athletes um and the concern for you know things being corrupted in, in some ways um and i know that there's been other issues with like players and their name and likeness and whether they can make money off it or not uh so I, hopefully the ncaa and everyone else can get this figured out <laughs> and prevent big scandals from happening but yeah it does seem like a challenge it, it's it's the age old uh, tug of war between commercialism and academics you know we're always fighting that are we in higher ed you're right in the middle of it and commercialism has prevailed in a lot of respects whether it's coaches making a lot of money or you know these huge facilities being built or players making a lot of money and sports betting and being infused on campuses commercialism is alive and well and it always challenges the academic values. And that's what's happening. It's been yeah. going on like this way for 30, 40 years. Or right. longer. Yep. Always, always an interesting thing. Um, so what are you currently working on then? What, what are you up to these days? So I'm the CEO of Lead One. We represent the 131 largest college athletic programs of the football bowl subdivision. We're working on all the different issues whether it's name, image, and likeness, the transfer portal, um, you know, how, how we juggle the employment issue involving student athletes, sports betting, you name it. Uh, and most recently, we've been working on how uh, FBS football should be governed within the NCAA. And so mm. there's never a lack of issues, and those are the things that we uh, spend our time on. Yeah, I'm sure that keeps you plenty busy and will for the yeah. foreseeable future. <laughs> it has. It really yeah. has. Never ending stream of stuff. Um, cool. Well, what's the best way for people to keep track of your work and you know follow what you're doing? If they go on our website, Tom at lead L E A D number one A dot com, they can it's actually it's the lead one association. Mm -hmm. So it's lead one, number one, association.com. So perfect. And I think you're also on Twitter, correct? Yes, we are on Twitter. So, okay. Perfect. And you have a personal page on Twitter, I think. That yeah. People can we have follow personal, and... Facebook. Cool. I have a Facebook page. So people can watch on that too. So cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all your knowledge and experiences. And you've done so many amazing things. So it's really cool to talk to you. Yeah, anytime and wish you that very happy holidays, Ben. Absolutely, you too.